Okay, I think we're live again. We're going to make another go at this. Uh, two guys from the Philly area like to talk basketball, and we're excited to have our first guest, uh, the coach of Moravian College, Coach Post. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a, it's a real honor to be the first guest. There's a lot of pressure with that, so hopefully I'll, I'll set the bar high moving forward here. We had a, a huge lineup of who we were going to make first, and – you were uh, nominated by people that you would be the great one to be first, and we'll talk about uh, the person that nominated you in a little bit. But uh, we're happy to have you on, a guy with a ton of experience coaching college basketball in Virginia and now outside of Virginia, Moravian College, a place that I grew up about 15, mile, 15 minutes south uh, in Quakertown, uh, right down 309. So you're going to bring a lot of experience um, to the kids and people out there listening with, uh, for Virginia basketball. And a little more on your background, I did, did some of the research, so I know that you started out interning while you were at Wagner. Yeah. And then you uh, went on to be an ass- work there as an assistant, and then uh, Christopher Newport and Randolph Macon, an assistant in both schools, two powerhouses in Virginia, before moving on to be the head coach at Bridgewater and had a successful four years there with four straight years being part of the tournament. And now you've just finished your first year at Moravian in Bethlehem, PA, and for those As Corey mentioned, who aren't familiar, it's, uh, I'd say, about 90 miles outside of New York City, about 60 miles from Philly, and about 15 miles from uh, the legendary Quaker Town area, where Corey's, uh, he claims his picture's on uh, all the walls. I thought I saw some signs saying you're entering uh, Corey Stitzel, you know, hometown, you know. Home of Corey I believe there's a lot of those signs. (laughs) (laughs) If you see them, don't let them in, is that what it says? (laughs) Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for joining us and appreciate you uh, taking the time out. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I feel old. This, this was my 13th season coaching college basketball. So I've been fortunate. To, I was 20 like when I first got that opportunity at Wagner. And um, I've worked with some great coaches um, and, and I've worked at some great programs. Like you, you said, that have had a lot of success. So I've, I've loved the very charmed coaching life. There's a lot of guys that you know, do it for a long time and don't get some of the opportunities um, that I've had. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a charmed life that I get to live and, you know, happy to talk hoops, you know, for a living and coach it for a living and give me chances to talk to people like you guys. So, you know, let's, let's do it. I'll add, I was fascinated when I looked at your background that uh, when you graduated from Wagner, you were summa cum laude and did in three years, you got that completed. And I think from my Latin uh, memory is that means with the highest level of distinction. So that pretty much would mean you're first in your class. That's pretty awesome. That's in like the Brad Stevens category of coaching. Is that, that how should we, how we should do that? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I, I was a good student. I, um, I, uh, you know, graduated early in three years and I got my master's because Wagner uh, paid for it. So I got my master's in business administration the following year. Um, but I've also chose to be a college coach for a living. So I don't know how, how smart I might be, you know, the, <laughs> the coach for a living. Uh, you know, what's funny is my brother, I have a younger brother, and I was always a way better student. You know, as you said, like, I, I was fortunate to have some pretty good academic accolades, and my brother never did. But I'm the college basketball coach, and my brother is a, is a surgeon in Brooklyn. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's interesting how that, how that worked out. And, you know, I'm always fascinated, too, by seeing coaches in the careers. And, you know, it's a very challenging profession. So your brother chose surgery. But uh, to be a coach, to be a head coach at the college level is a very difficult path to get to. And you do have to earn your uh, keep along the way with a lot of different stops. So seeing your background, you've earned it along the way. And having your second stint as the head coach. So congratulations again on the uh, job at Moravia. Thanks. No, yeah, it's it's part uh, aptitude, uh, but it also you gotta get some lucky luck along the way. And and I've been lucky with the places I've been at, the, the success we've had, and the people I've uh, gotten to know and give me opportunities. So like anything, uh, um, it's luck plus you know hopefully being somewhat skilled to at least fake it till you make it kind of thing. <laughs> Well, we were, we were talking a little bit, uh, Coach Stitzel and I earlier about uh, recruiting in the Virginia area. Uh, different challenges and uh, you know, what when you look at recruiting uh, you know what is your focus what is the best way uh, to find a prospect and what is it that you're looking for when you're uh, looking for a prospect to come out to Maria yeah um, yeah Virginia's been great I think Virginia's obviously a great state to recruit to I have 
lot of experience doing it at, at three different schools in, in the state. Uh, first, it starts with where you're looking. I think the internet certainly has, uh, has really shrunk, uh, you know, the distances in terms of where you can go to see recruits. You know, you're able to kind of use the internet to get leads and, and watch kids from all over the place and maybe recruit further away than you normally would have because you're, you're able to see kids um, a lot more through their highlight videos and through their, you know, the game films from AAU and, and high school. Um, AAU is certainly a really important aspect of the recruiting process because it allows you to see a whole bunch of kids in one setting and for small colleges like the ones I've been at, you know, it's very efficient and cost effective, you know, to go to AAU tournaments and see hundreds of kids, um, you know, over the course of a weekend. Uh, and then obviously high school as well uh, to see, um, see guys play with their high school teams and that kind of structure. So utilizing different resources to, to evaluate kids and watch kids. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of the profile, uh, it's really about trying to find the best fit for what you're looking for in terms of their skills, uh, what they bring to the table in terms of athleticism and size um, and their basketball skill. And then, you know, their, their intangibles, their, their toughness, their mental toughness, their resiliency, how good of a teammate are they, how high character are they, how coachable are they, um, you know, and how that fits into what you're looking for, you know, in your program. So there's no exact science to it, uh, but it's, you know, you're looking at all those different factors and trying to then build a relationship with the recruit, with their parents, um, with their coaches, and, and sell, you know, your vision for your program and that recruits place and how and, and how he can develop and grow and find success within your program. So it's a very people centric, you know, relationship uh, centric uh, element to coaching. And in speaking of that, you know, Moravian, uh, you know, good four or five hours, four hours away. You've got a kid that played for me in AAU uh, in CJ Weber from James River High School in Richmond you know, a very good program down there for, in my opinion, who've done this for a long time, who, you know, tries to help guys at a lot of different levels of, of coaches, sending players, I think it is a heck of a get. And I'm not saying that because he played for me, but not only that, but what a get for you, you know, going to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to get a kid from Richmond uh, to go to, to Moravian, who I think is going to be an impact guy at some point. Um, talk about how, you know, Virginia – you know, a lot of ODACs and, and people in the ODAC think, you know, that they're the greatest thing in the world. And, and I remind anybody from the ODAC conference who's going to watch this that didn't really like CJ recruits, CJ, you were a one bid league this year, right? Okay. So before you guys think that the ODAC's so great that and passed on CJ or told me, well, I don't know this or that. Okay. You're a one bid league. Okay. Well, I mean, the best, second best team in your league wasn't even on the, uh, on the board because their strength of schedule stunk. And if their league was better, you know, that strength of schedule wouldn't have stunk. So, for you to go away from all those ODACs and get a kid uh, to Moravian, talk about that process a little bit. Obviously, you had a relationship with me and and and, and Coach Blazer at, at James River, but heck of a get, Moravian to Richmond doesn't always happen. Yeah, I I won't I won't touch that third rail of the ODAC uh, <laughs> strength and whatnot because you know I I a lot of those guys in my league spent four years in that league uh, spent four years beating beating up on my teams. Uh, when I coached in it, uh, but um, I, I, like we, I just said, intangibles and skill, I, I think CJ's got a ton of skill and his ability to score the ball and shoot the ball, and he's a just absolutely, I think, coach's dream in terms of the intangibles, in terms of his work ethic, in terms of type of kid he is and how he'll represent um, your program, and so, you know, I, I love Virginia. Virginia's got a lot of talent. It's extremely competitive in terms of the talent pool of recruits, um, that are in there so just because there are a lot of high quality schools in the state doesn't mean you have to write it off and and like we said recruiting is very people centric so when you have relationships built up with coaches AAU coaches like yourself coach Stitzel or high school coaches like yourself or um, CJ's uh, coach uh, at James River you got to pursue it um, because I think you know kids like that help you win games and, and so if you can build those relationships and and uh, nurture it and just because uh, you're four hours away you know four and a half hours away some people like getting away a little bit and doing uh, and you know being in a different environment because you know like coach Gallagher said we're 
relatively close to New York City and relatively close to Philadelphia. So it's a nice, unique spot where you're, you're you know, an hour to an hour and a half from two of the biggest cities in the country. Um, you know, college town, you have Lehigh, Lafayette, um, a couple other Division three schools, all within about 15 minutes of each other here. So we feel like we have some positive things to sell. Great academics, a great campus, really supportive administration. So why not? You know, we had some other kids from Virginia um, visit us. They didn't end up working out, but you know, for us, Virginia will always be a state. We'll we'll try to you know uh, pull recruits from because of just you know the t- the quality of the competition and, and the recruits uh, in that high school uh, and AAU realm in in Virginia. I got to think based on your experience, Virginia experience and now being having access to the Philadelphia New York markets, you've just expanded. Right, the chances of uh, the recruiting grounds in which you have those connections and have built those relationships. And probably over time, you understand who you can trust, whose insight is valuable, and, and who is just trying to sell a kid you know, to get an opportunity. What I really like, what I really like about you, Post, and, and people watching this is you're a worker, and I'm a guy that you know, deals with a lot of coaches in Division I, II, three, and whatever, and you got to work, you know. I've actually been very impressed with what I've watched on Twitter of some of these kids committing to some division three schools and in a difficult time, I would think for division three schools where there's money involved, you got to pay money and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've been impressed with some schools when I see the commitment, but you know, what you do a really good job of is you outwork a lot of people and um, you know, you're not at a can't miss schools that you've been at as a head coach, as an assistant maybe, but as a head coach and, and for you to get a CJ Weber, it means you got to work. And, uh, you know, my advice to a lot of people that are going to watch this and who like me or don't like me is some of these guys got to start working. Um, and, and, and you got to be able to say a Moravian, you know, obviously my brother's a coach at Millersville is going to be a top 10 team in the country next year. And he's got seven Virginia kids on his roster. So, you know, Virginia's got a lot of players. So some of these schools got to start working. And I think you're a great example of that um, to be able to go to Richmond and get a kid in your first recruiting class. I think that's going to pay dividends down you for you in a in fertile area like Virginia for a long time. Yeah, no, I hope so. You know, when I, when I was at Bridgewater, we had the rookie of the year in the ODAC from uh, Savannah, Georgia, you know? Uh, so I think uh, like coach Gallagher mentioned, expanding your recruiting ge- ge- geography uh, can be really beneficial in getting kids that normally wouldn't come into your league. Uh, and that's been the, that's been, you know, positive in my, in my experiences. Um, but like you said, in terms of the work, you know, in division three, we don't have um, scholarship, athletic scholarships and the financial aid packages can vary greatly from school to school. So it's not an even playing field. And so one of the, the really one of the few things you have control of in the recruiting process is, you know, how hard you work at it and how you try to the time and effort that you put into um, developing those relationships and showing your top recruits, you know, how much of a priority they are to you. Uh, one of the things I like to say uh, to recruits and their parents is the most valuable thing that any of us have is our time. You know, that's it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a scarce currency. You don't get it back. Uh, and so as a coach, the more time you're spending on a recruit, uh, I think is really the truest way to show them uh, how much you care about them, how important they are to uh, your recruiting class and your program and your vision uh, for the future. Uh, and I think, you know, if you do that right and, and, you're, and you're honest and you're consistent in, in the things you say, uh, that can be a competitive advantage like, like you alluded to, Coach Stetzel. Yeah, Coach Stetzel and I talked our last podcast about fit and probably the more time you spend with someone, the more you can determine, do they fit into my program? Is this the right school for that person? Which I think yeah. is very valuable as well. Absolutely, because recruiting, like I said, it's not an exact science, and you got to try to um, develop um, a real understanding of the recruit, and it, and if it's going to be a fit, uh, and you got to really um, make sure that they're going to be what you what you think they are, you know, because the worst thing is when you don't have a full understanding, and the recruit ends up not being the right fit, because it could really set your program back. So it's the work you got to put in to to really understand. Um, the makeup of the recruit and also another really critical component is having people you trust give you their opinion of that recruit if you can have that in the process that's actually probably the most valuable um, valuable thing because most times people um, who don't know 
like if people doesn't don't know me, they're not going to probably trash a kid or say something negative about a recruit. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if there's someone you trust that knows that recruit, they might give you a more, um, you know, unvarnished, truthful, you know, um, uh, report on what the strengths and weaknesses, you know, that recruit might be. Last year, uh, it was great. You were able to make your way out to uh, Independence for Corey's showcase uh, day, where a lot of college coaches came to watch players as well. And just in a one-day environment of, you know, players being thrown into uh, drills, skill work, and then uh, and just pickup games. Um, you know, those type of environments, are you able to see the type of player you want or, or see them in, in, would they be good for my school? Is that the type of environment that's helpful? Yeah, it's, it's definitely helpful and it's, a, it's an important piece. So you could add that, you know, the AAU high school and showcases like that. It's really important because for instance, you know, at Moravian, we don't have, um, you know, full-time assistants. So uh, I'm doing a lot of the recruiting myself. And you talk about time, you know, you can only be in so many places at once. You only, you only have so much of a recruiting budget. Uh, so you have to be efficient and effective in, in your recruiting. And so anytime you can see a large number of players compete in one day, in one place, it's hugely valuable. Um, and you're seeing them, like you, like you said, in different um, elements. So there's that skill breakdown, the drill, how do they look um, in drills and then how they look competing five on five. So you're getting different, different feels for um, how they look in different settings, which is also um, helpful to, to develop that well, well-rounded, um, you know, evaluation of the recruit. Yeah. We hope to bring that back here when the world opens up, it was a great event where we had over 30 coaches, you know, scholarship division three, we want to bring that back. We were supposed to have one here this spring and hopefully we can get that rolling in the fall or whenever the world opens back up. It was a great event. It was great for, for kids here and locally, a great for independence to host it, but we had kids from all over, as you well know. So um, hopefully we can get back to that. So I'm going to shift topics a little bit. We've been all stuck in the quarantine and I'm sure like most fans, you've been watching the last dance and watching uh, Michael Jordan on the last episode and just seeing that, maniacal focus on winning and how demanding he was of his teammates and just pushing them to achieve at the highest level. Um, have you ever had a player like that or any insight? How would you coach a player like that when you're having he, him create that type of environment on the team? Yeah. Um, well, I think, if, you know, when you have a player like Michael Jordan, you kind of give him the, the free reign, right? You know, and, and you help like Phil Jackson did you know, manage it. So when you have a super competitive player, obviously you don't want to stifle that um, competitiveness and that passion, but also you need to make sure it's directed and focused at, at the right, right things, you know, um, because, you know, and at the division three level, um, you know, that could be a and in division two or division one. A lot of times uh, what separates kids in terms of who's a scholarship player, who's not, or how much, you know, how far you can take your God given abilities is that intangible of how competitive are you? How passionate are you? How much do you want to win? Because ultimately, you know, we're here as coaches to win games. And so you're looking for guys that have that winning mentality and winning attitude, um, you know, like a Michael Jordan does. And at Randolph Macon, um, the season, I, I was an assistant there. We were number one in the country, made the Elite Eight, um, lost a heartbreaker in, in the Elite Eight. And that'll be, as coaches, we all have games that haunt us in, in that game. That Elite Eight game will, will haunt me forever because I, I really think we could have won national championship. And, and that Randolph-Macon team, obviously we had very good players, but we didn't have studs. We didn't even have the ODAC player of the year that year on that team. Um, we didn't have any All-Americans. That team was great because it was a group of guys that just really wanted to win. And, and they had the, tough, the mental toughness to get through adversity. And they, their goal – every time they came out on the floor was how can we get better as a team today? Um, and how, what can we do? What do we need to do to win? Um, it was a senior group, but that, that, that year, that team really taught me that how important what you said, that competitiveness, that, that passion, that winning mentality and being about that above anything else can really take a team beyond what its individual talents um, might say it's ceiling is. Let's uh, let me interrupt you one second. Randolph Macon, you were an assistant at Randolph Macon under Nate Davis. Now the coach at Bucknell who's had a heck of a run at Bucknell, but there's a young man that you worked with 
at Randolph Macon, a guy that I have promoted on Twitter that if athletic directors across the country are watching this or listening to this, they need to give him a chance. Joe Meehan, uh, a legend uh, in the college basketball recruiting circles. You worked with him. Is it true that the guy drives a Beamer? <laughs> I, I can't deny that. He does. You know, and he, everything Joe Meehan does is high, high level. So, um, <laughs> obviously, uh, he was a big part of our, our success at Macon. And, obviously, he's brought a lot of uh, high-level guys at Bucknell. Uh, I think um, they've been there five years in four conference championships, either regular season or NCAA tournament in those five years. So, um, he's, he's big time. And, and, and the Beamer is just a reflection of that in, in his big time. Is. And last thing about Joe Meehan, is it true when you knew him that he <laughs> struck out going on dates as much as Cecil Fielder did when he played with the Detroit Tigers? Is it true or is, is that false and he's the ladies' man that he claims up there in Lewisburg where, you know, who knows what he's doing up there. He's now a landlord, whatever he is. Is it true? what he says about being a ladies' man, or did he get caught looking at a lot of breaking balls when he asked for dates? Wow, that's another third rail that you just really <laughs> set me up to, to get shocked by. I'll say this, Joe is a tremendous human being, and I think he does, uh, I think Lewisburg has, has done well for him uh, in his social uh, experience department. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great topics. I'm going to shift topics. I know. Oh, wait, did you see how quickly Gallagher wanted to get off this topic right there? He wouldn't even let you retort this there, Corey. I is, feel this like he's important to this process. He's like the, the, the steer in the ship right there. These were the game situations where it's like, okay, I see a tech coming. Let me, let me jump in. I see the T coming. I'll tell you what, though, that, it, it, like you talk about people watching this. That's a great assistant right there. Like, I, Absolutely. I, but when you're talking Joe Mahan, there, I mean, the guy's a legend. They should <laughs> hire him. So, it's easy to get carried away talking about Joe Mahan. I understand. Well, we were talking about passion before that. We were talking about passionate of the passion of Michael Jordan and intensity. So I've been dying to ask you about this. So I know you're a Springsteen fan. I am a lifelong Springsteen fan growing up outside of Philly. So I'm in 1979 in the Philly Spectrum, 1980 again, and many, many more times after that. So, a couple questions. Easy one, favorite Springsteen song? What's your favorite one? Sure, sure. Um, and I'll have to say this too, you know, I, my Springsteen uh, in person, you know, I wasn't born until 87. I don't want to make you feel Ouch. there. Ouch. You know, so, all, but I've seen them like 18 times, I think, in concert now. Um, I'm about know. 15, so you're ahead of me. Yeah, a little bit. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a fanatic. But uh, Thunder Road would be the answer to your question, favorite. Thunder Road is mine as well. Followed by Jungle Land. What is the most underrated Springsteen song that you think doesn't get enough attention? That's a great question. I would say one, uh, Atlantic City. Yeah. Um, very, very good song, especially in concert. The concert full band version of that is is uh, is big time. And then another one I would say No Surrender off the uh, Born in the USA album. Another, another very underrated uh, Springsteen song. Great choices. Great choices. I barely even know who the guy is. I don't even know who Bruce Tasting is. <laughs> Yeah, unless he's six he's nine, and he can run the floor and shoot a pick and pop. I don't know who he is. Unless he's a point guard from Jersey, you have no interest in him. No idea. <laughs> well, Coach Coach Sissel, you have any other questions or comments? No, what I would say is, and who knows, we're going to watch this. We're going to have go, uh, a lot of guests on or whatever. Is you know, I would say is I'm a guy that always likes to think outside the box, and 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 I think for kids, my AU kids, my high school kids. You know, Moravian is a place to look. You know, I think these kids in Virginia get so carried away with the overrated ODAC. Um, and they need to go look at other different places where there's coaches that work and do the right things. And I think Moravian is a really good academic school. Growing up where I grew up, you know, if you could get into Moravian, it was a big deal. Um, it wasn't, you know, a school that everybody that applied to. It was a big deal. I think kids need to look at schools like this. Like Moravian, Coach Post does a really good job. Nobody will work harder recruiting him. And um, I think Moravian's a really good option. And I hope that we have prospects and parents watch this start Googling Moravian and get out of the CNUs and get out of the overrated ODAC. <laughs> oh, man. Well, well I'll, I'll say this. You know, <laughs> love stirring the pot. I, I, there's a lot of great schools in Virginia, obviously. It's tremendous for D3 basketball. Um, but – 
if if uh, if you're looking to expand your horizons, I do really believe strongly in the opportunity we have here, and and uh, you know I think our our geographic setting uh, is still close enough to a lot of places in Virginia where it's a day drive, and um, you know we'll play some games. You know we play some games in the North Virginia area every year. Catholic universities in our league, so um, you know I uh, I have a lot of respect for the uh, ODAC and the CNUs and the people. Glad you do. <laughs> um, so I'll just go on the record there so I don't get angry text messages and emails about it. But uh, if, if uh, it's always good, I think in the recruiting process, especially early on, um, if you have the time and you have the means to explore different options, uh, because uh, I think uh, for a lot of recruits, 17, 18 year olds, um, you don't, they're not really sure what they're looking for and what they want. And until you start visiting schools, and um, going places and seeing it live firsthand, I, I think that's a real critical stage and where you get to real have a better feel for what might be a good fit for you. Um, and so if the school's showing interest in you, um, it can't hurt if you have time to go on official visits, you know, uh, to different places and uh, explore your options. And I think we offer a, a great option, obviously, if, uh, if people are interested. Well, Coach Post, head coach of Moravian College, thank you for joining us, our first guest on the show. We appreciate you taking the time. Good luck in the season ahead. Thank Look you. That, that, was tough. That, that was a ringer right there I got put through. And, uh, you know, Corey always keeps you on your toes. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you out on the recruiting trail here, you know, with the pandemic. You saw probably what the NABC came out with today, right, that the likely uh, they're going to shut it down until August 1 um, and then look to – start AAU live periods or whatever, August and September. But that may or may not apply to Division three schools, correct? You're not under the Division one and two rule. It's up to your institution, if I read that rule correct. So hopefully to have you at a Virginia premier practice sooner than later. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the recruiting uh, dead periods uh, only apply to Division one, Division two. Obviously, there's nowhere um, for Division threes to go right now. But uh, if you know, uh, in June, July, and, and things continue to improve, um, and and people are having practices. Uh, you know, it'll be up to the, the individual Division three institutions uh, to allow their coaches to recruit at those at those types of things. So I would expect, hopefully, we can uh, uh, continue on a on a positive path here, and with that, with this pandemic, that uh, we'll be able to get out and start you know interacting with people um, in person uh, sooner, ho hopefully, rather than later. Sounds good. Thanks again, Coach. Thanks for taking time out. No, thanks for having me. You guys are great. It's a, it's a good way to get through a quarantine day, spend your afternoon <laughs> talking, talking with you guys and talking some Springsteen. So I, I, I think it's a great conversation. What, what more can you ask for? Great. Thanks, everyone.